Hello. Today we're going to do the quenching experiment and fluorescence quenching. Going to be a little few changes. You're going to have to note these in the experimental section, right? Had some trouble with this one. People not getting the reproducibility I really wanted to get on that Stan Palmer plot. So what we're going to do is we're going to move today to fluorescein, made up a nice new fluorescein sample, two times 10 to the minus six molar fluorescein we're going to use, not rhodamine B, fluorescein. And we're going to use as a quencher, right? A quencher, what, what's fluorescence? Fluorescence that we're going to use a photon to excite a molecule, fluorescein, to an excited state, excited electronic state. And then it will relax radiatively, right? Shoots out a photon. That's the fluorescence. That's what we want to me measure. But a quencher is a species, a chemical species that gets in there, this time in solution, collides with that excited state and takes the energy away non-radiatively. Usually you lose that energy to just heat, to vibrational motion of the, the quencher, the solvent, and all this other stuff. What are we going to use as a quencher? Well, we're going to use iodide, right? Quenching, usually large Z molecules are better, or atoms are better at quenching than low Z, right? So we're going to use iodide, right? Way down there on the periodic chart. And where, what kind of solution we're going to use? Well, we're going to use a solution of fluorescein in water with 10th molar, 0.1 molar KOH. Turns out the fluorescence depends on the pH. We need to control the pH. We're going to make this basic pH KOH, 10th molar KOH. We're going to keep the K plus and the OH minus concentration constant. So we're going to add the varying amounts of KOH, 0.1 molar KOH with 0.1 molar Ki, right? So we're always going to have 15 mLs of these in some, that'll keep the K plus and the OH minus concentrations constant. And we're always going to add 10 mLs of the fluorescein. That'll keep the fluorescein constant. We don't want any cross contamination. We've got to be really careful about that. We want to keep K plus constant. We want to keep OH minus constant because the pH does affect the uh, fluorescence as well. So we've got to keep that constant. And we want to change only the iodide concentration. So I've got some, what I did special for this is down here, I've got some pipettes, right? One just for the fluorescein, a set that are just for the Ki plus KOH, and a set that are just for the KOH solutions. We don't want any cross contamination. So we're gonna, that's one measure we're gonna take there, right? And we're going to get those in the right sizes so we have a minimal amount of pipetting that we have to do. All right. So we do that. We pipe that into some 50 ml beakers, right? Nicely cleaned. Everything was cleaned. Now, remember, this is another thing I think that people have been doing. You have to rinse those pipettes beforehand with distilled water, right? And then you should also rinse them with the solutions that you're going to pipette into them. Good pipetting technique. Rinse out your bulb too. Who knows what was in the bulb before? All that kind of good stuff. And we're going to use one uh, transfer pipette. We'll stir things up and fill up as the usual, you know, two thirds to three quarters of the way, uh, a four side clear cuvette. All right. One for each solution, right? Here we have no Ki added, two mLs, five mLs, seven mLs, and 10 mLs of the Ki solution, and a proportionately changing amount of the KOH solution so that we can get the right uh, concentration control. All right, so what do we do? We have a solution that we want to measure the fluorescence of. We have to excite it with a photon. Where are we going to excite? Oh, what we have to do is we're going to have to take an absorption spectrum because you have to excite the molecule where it absorbs light. And that I've done just a regular UV vis spectrum. There you see it. Boom. There's the UV vis spectrum of fluorescein. We're going to excite at the absorption maximum. That's at 490 nanometers. Now, where are we going to detect the light? Well, to determine that, what we need to do is take the dye with no Ki added, right? And 
we need to take the absorption spectrum. What do we have to set? We have to set the excitation wavelength. We know where to set the excitation wavelength. We set it at the absorption maximum. But what we have to do now is determine what the fluorescence maximum is, what the wavelength of the maximum fluorescence is, right? And we have to determine uh, what slit widths we need to use. So we're going to excite at 490 nanometers. Where are we going to detect? You always detect to the red, to the red side, to the long wavelength side of where you excite, right? Because you're going to excite a uh, with a photon the molecule to an electronic state. And when it relaxes, that photon that comes out is always going to be the same or less energy, lower energy than what you excited with. That's the red side, the longer wavelength side. So let's do it from say uh, 500 nanometers to 550 nanometers. All right. Then the other thing we have to do is slit the slit width, right? Smaller slit, higher resolution, less signal. Right, so we've got a slit on the excitation side, a slit on the emission side. We've got to set both of those. What, why do we want to set them? Well, we want to get maximum resolution. We don't want to see any scattered light, right? But we want maximum signal without saturating the detector. So we need to open them up as wide as we can to get loads of signal, but not too wide that we see scattered light, not too wide that we saturate the detector. So let's start off at 1.5 nanometers on each of those and see what happens, right? Excited 490, we're trying to figure out where we're going to get a fluorescence maximum. And so we have 1.5 nanometer slits, both ex um, not a whole lot of signal. How do we get more signal? Open up the slits. Oh, there we go. Okay, so we open up the slits. If we double the size of the slit, we get four times the signal because it's, you're opening up the slit, you get more, it's the area of kind of thing, right? So we, let's open them up to 2.5 and 2.5. Boom. Say, okay. Get into, eh, well, there's some signal, right? Can you just see it? There it is, eh, some signal, but it's under 200. Oh, so we still got another factor of four. We could open up one of the slits even more. Which one should we open up? We could open up the excitation. If we open that up, we might get more excitation, sure, but we could have more scattered light. Let's open up the detection side first. We're not really, you can see this is a big broad peak. We don't have to worry about resolution. Let's open up the emission slit to five and run it again. Boom. We're going to do that. Open, oh, look at that, baby. Now there's signal. Yes. Yeah, baby. Okay, so now we're up here above 800. We've got maximum signal without being saturated. I think we're good to go, right? So what we need to do is write down what we have so far, okay? We know the solutions we made. Don't worry, I'll give you this data. We made up those solutions, right? With varying amounts of, of Ki, constant amounts of KOH, constant amounts of Di. And now we're going to excite at 490, the absorption maximum. We're going to, oh wait, where's the emission maximum? Oh, we look here, the emission maximum, which is 515. It's a nice broad peak, 515 is a nice round number. Okay, good. So there it is, the emission maximum, that's 515. Slits, we set the slits in order to get uh, the maximum signal without saturating, 2.5 nanometers on the excitation slit, 0.5 nanometers on the emission slit, that's good. All right, and then, you know, where did I, where did I start this? Remember, you don't want to see, notice this, you see, right, the, the peak like this, right? You never want to get to, the excitation's out here at 490. You never want to get closer than the sum of those two slit widths, right? We had 2.5 plus 5 nanometers, that's 7.5 nanometers, we're doing it at 490, so we could detect at 500, that's fine as long as you're above that window, because you don't want to see the, the scattered light, you don't want to see the excitation, it can just swamp your detector, right? But we got a nice peak here, peaking at 515 nanometers. And now for our data, we only need simple reads, right? We don't need to save those. We set up just simple reads, right? We're going to set the excitation 
wavelength to 490 nanometers. We're going to detect an emission wavelength of 515 nanometers, right? The absorption maximum is where we excite. The fluorescence maximum is where we detect the excitation slit, 2.5 nanometers, emission slit, 5 nanometers. That's average for 0.3 seconds, good. And then the only other thing we have to worry about is the zero. What's the zero? The zero is not a solution that contains fluorescein. It contains everything else. So we're going to use we're going to use just KOH plus KI as the background, right? The blank, and we'll run that for the zero. Here you just click on zero. It says you have a sample in there. Yes, you're right. There's like no signal there. It's a bunch of electronic air. Maybe a little bit of scattered light or who knows what off of the off of the uh, cubet itself, you know, that kind of stuff. It's less than one count. We had over 800 counts of fluorescence, right? And we got less than a count of backup. It's forgettable, right? So it's good, but it's going to subtract that anyway for us. And now all we need to do is pop our signal in, pop our solutions in the cubets, right? We've got five of them with changing Ki, but careful the fluorescence is temperature dependent. Oh, so you have to leave them in there three to five minutes. I was actually good. Left them all in there at least five minutes this time, right? To collect this data. Oh, let me give you a little secret. You know, we've got the temperature controller for the fluorescence machine. There's also a temperature controller for the UV Viz. If nobody's in here and you need to control the temperature, put the sample you're about to measure in the fluorescence and the next one you're going to measure put it in the uv vis and get it down to temperature where you want it to be and it won't take as long Shh, don't tell anybody that secret right but you can use both of these to, to cool things off so that's what i'm going to do cool everything down to 20 degrees c and i'm going to take the fluorescence then as a function of iodide concentration then we're going to take out those samples Use the one that has no iodide added and measure its fluorescence as a function of temperature. Five step, five degree steps, right? But remember, there's that overshoot problem. So always set it to like half a degree below where you want to go, let it shoot up to that, then turn it up to the temperature you want, and you won't have to worry about it shooting over. Give it three minutes at each temperature, right? After it's reached temperature to make sure that it's equilibrated, and then boom simple read. All you need is the fluorescence intensity for each one of those temperatures. Then I'll send you that data and you can see what it looks like. And let me tell you, it's gorgeous. All right, that's fluorescence quadrant.